وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Afifa Kawaja, and welcome to Muslim Perspectives. Over the past few weeks, we've been discussing the global scenario and what we could expect in the coming decade. Today, we continue our discussion with Brother Zafar Bangish in light of some recent developments that have occurred. Some are disturbing, others are hopeful. Please welcome to the program, Brother Zafar Bangish. Thank you. Let's begin with the killing of Salman Thasir, the governor of Punjab by his bodyguard. Why exactly did this happen? Well, um, Pakistan is a, a very tragic situation. Um, there is a great divide in the country. There is great turmoil. Um, there are internal divisions. There are external pressures uh, that are exerted uh, on Pakistan. Now, uh, Salman Taseer uh, belonged to uh, the ruling party, the Pakistan People's Party and um, he was the governor of Punjab province which is the largest province in Pakistan and he was appointed governor by um, President Asif Ali Zardari precisely because he wanted to keep the um, Pakistan Muslim League led government in Punjab under control. Regrettably Salman Taseer was not a very good character despite whatever people say about him. I mean, you know, in Pakistan, uh, unfortunately, um, there is this secular lobby that um, uh, glamorizes secularists, uh, godless people who um, are very arrogant, who are very much uh, tied to the West and are promoting their agenda. And according to his own bodyguard who killed him on uh, January the 3rd um, in Islamabad uh, while Salman Taseer had just had lunch at a posh restaurant in Islamabad. Uh, his own bodyguard um, killed him. And in order to understand, I mean, first of all, of course, you know, killing of anybody is a tragic thing. Nobody should sort of, you know, support it or, you know, in any way accept it. I mean, I don't think that our viewers should get the wrong impression that I'm in any way right. supporting killing or anything. I just want to put it into the context. You see, just look at this. Uh, in Pakistan, there is, a, as I said, a tiny minority that is in power, in control. Uh, their values, their outlook are completely different from the values and outlooks of the vast majority of people. So they're disconnected. Exactly. The vast majority of the people in Pakistan are uh, religious, decent people. And yet you have this tiny minority that has usurped power in Pakistan. They are pushing their secular agenda. And let me give you a couple of examples in order to understand why this thing happened and how this happened. You see, these um, rulers, these secularists, etc., as I said, they lead a very um, extravagant lifestyle. Uh, on Christmas and New Year's Eve, they have wild parties at their huge palatial homes. Alcohol is served, wild parties take place, their, their girls, their daughters, their women, they dance, and so on, which is the ordinary people in Pakistan find it very offensive. Right. And even his bodyguards, because these are ordinary people, people from the villages and so on, who have a deep attachment to Islam. That's one dimension. Now, you look at Pakistan today, um, the overwhelming majority of the people are deprived of electricity and gas in this very terrible winter. Like, you know, uh, electricity goes off and it's uh, uh, off for 10 to 12 hours in a 24-hour cycle. Right. Similarly, gas. People hardly get any gas to be able to cook food. So... And the food prices are astronomically high. Fuel prices are astronomically high. So here you have a situation where the ordinary people are living a very, very difficult life. That's the overwhelming majority. And yet a tiny minority is living it up their extravagant lifestyle. So that's one aspect of it which breeds resentment. 
The other which is much more serious and which in fact came to the fore in case of the killing of Salman Tasir, which was with respect to this uh, law that is referred to as the blasphemy law in Pakistan, which means that anybody who insults uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be uh, executed because this is a capital offense under Islamic law. This is in the Quran, this is proved from Hadith. And Salman Tasir made uh, a very provocative statement on television. Uh, two days before he was killed, he spoke on television and he called this law a black law. Now you see, for an ordinary Muslim who is deeply attached to the Prophet ﷺ and he would sacrifice his life for the Prophet ﷺ, this would be so offensive, so deeply offensive that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are people that are bound to flip and they say, well, okay, that's the red line that he has crossed and now we really have to do something about it. I mean, obviously somebody could ask a question. Why didn't the person or anybody take this matter to a court of law? Like, you know, charge Salman Tasir. The problem is, in Pakistan, an ordinary person cannot get justice. You know, the, the courts are sort of so much controlled by the, by the secularists, although today we have an activist peace just, uh, uh, chief justice in Pakistan, but the overwhelming majority of the courts are controlled and there is a lot of nepotism and external pressure, governmental pressure, political pressure. So, for an average person, uh, when he feels aggrieved, there are no avenues left for them to turn to. And so this particular guard, he flipped, and obviously we can see from the reaction in society that the overwhelming majority of the people in Pakistan support his action, regrettable as it is. You know, I mean, obviously I'm saying that, you know, we shouldn't be supporting people killing other people. Right. But the fact is that to insult the Prophet of Allah, it's a great, grievous, grievous, you know, sort of crime. It's a sin. And so this bodyguard of his, he felt so aggrieved that he took the law into his own hands. I mean, you know, in Pakistan, he was a policeman. In, in Pakistan, the police have a very terrible reputation. You know, they do a lot of terrible things to ordinary people. And, but here it is, like, you know, when they do terrible things to ordinary people, nobody takes notice of it. That's right. Okay, but here is a situation when a policeman kills the governor, then all hell breaks loose in the media and in the secular establishment and so on. You know, so you can see this also reflects the disconnect in society. So we've basically gotten the image of an elitist ruling class and a body of people who they have pretty much no connection to. How do you see this uh, divide being bridged? Well, that's a very good question. I think that's really the fundamental question. You know, on the one hand, these uh, ruling elites in Pakistan, they claim that Pakistan has a democracy. But what kind of a democracy is it in which um, the feudal lords always win the elections? That's right. You know, because they have money, uh, they use this money, their ill-gotten wealth, they use that to buy votes. And in any case, only 25 to 30 percent of the people bother to vote any anyway because the people know that it's not going to make any difference to their lives. Right. So they say to hell with it. it it's not going to, all it's going to do is one set of thieves will oppress another set of thieves. So wh what's the difference, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just like, I mean, I, I think they are, they, are, they are right when they think that it's just like mice going to vote for a black cat as opposed to a white cat or, a, or voting for a white cat as opposed to a black cat. Yes. It makes absolutely no difference to their miserable life. I mean, the cat is a cat and it's going to go and eat the mice. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, why the hell we should bother with this thing? So, number one, in Pakistan, as I said, there is no democracy, a genuine democracy. Number two, there are no representatives of the people or like, you know, there is, a, there is not a movement as such in Pakistan that can lead the people in a positive direction. I personally feel very strongly that if uh, this divide has to be narrowed, then first of all, the ruling elites ought to develop better manners. They must not insult these ordinary people the way they do now. Right. They mustn't insult the honor of the prophet. They must, you know, come to senses. Because if these kinds of trends continue, I clearly see a very violent revolution taking place in Pakistan. In fact, in some in senses, I'm surprised that that has not occurred yet because of the level of oppression, the level of, you know, suffering of the people. Like, you know, we saw 
when the floods occurred in Pakistan. There was no government to speak of. I mean, there was nobody to go and help the people. Right. Like for days on end, people were marooned in these isolated, desolate uh, pockets uh, here and there. And there was no government help to them. The only people that went to help them was ordinary people, other ordinary people, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, charitable organizations. But surely, I mean, the scale of the disaster was so massive that the government should have been at the forefront. And yet, you know what happened? If you look at it, and this is indicative of how people think, uh, Zardari set up a fund that, you know, he wants to set up a relief fund. And, and people immediately, like, you know, he set it up uh, under the name of one of his daughters, uh, Bakhta or uh, Zarda Bhutto or whatever, you know, relief fund, because he wanted to promote her now. Most people saw this as a move by Zardari to steal more money. So people were not interested in giving him money. Mm -hmm. You know, who did, the, who did the people give money to in Pakistan? Imran Khan, who heads the um, Justice Party in Pakistan, mm -hmm. he raised 2 billion rupees in a matter of a couple of weeks. Wow. Now you can see that people have much more trust in him. Right. Because they see, and why do they have trust in him? Because they saw that he was a, a cricket star. Uh, then he launched a campaign in the country and set up the uh, Shaukat Khanam Memorial uh, Hospital, a uh, cancer hospital, the only hospital of its kind in Pakistan and with no government funding. He raised all the money, billions and billions of rupees and dollars and so on. Then now he has set up a university in Miawali called Gomel, uh, the, whatever I think it's called, I don't think it's called Gomel University, but whatever it's called, he set up a university. Now you see, Education is government responsibility and yet you see that ordinary people are raising money from the people to do so. So people saw that here is a person by the name of Imran Khan, he's a politician as well now. Uh, he has done some good work in Pakistan and he has done it honestly, people can see it. And so they were more than willing to give him money rather than give it to the government. So that can sort of gives you an indication that the government has absolutely no connection with the people whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's just there in the corridors of power, in the presidential palace, in the prime minister's palace, whatever. And as far as the people are concerned, they see this government or any other government as not helpful to them. So if these ruling elites understand that there is a great hatred building for them in society and that they rectify their behavior, I think we could probably see some positive changes. But otherwise, I am really seeing a very violent uprising in Pakistan and a lot of, you know, there'll be a lot of mess, a lot of chaos, a lot of bloodshed. Uh, and regrettably, I don't really see any great charismatic leaders. I think, you know, in all honesty, I think perhaps apart from Imran Khan, and he's not a religious person in any sense, but at least he's honest. Mm -hmm. People can see that he's doing the right thing. So in that sense, I think people are reposing hope in him that perhaps he might be the one that might be able to bring some kind of sanity to, to that society. There was also the shooting rampage in Tucson, Arizona, in which six people were killed, uh, another 14 injured, including Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. What, does that, what exactly does this tell us about American politics of the current time? Well, you know, th there is a, uh, a very good sort of, you know, parallel between what happened in Pakistan and what's, hap what ha what's happened in the U.S. I mean, in the U.S., the society is also deeply polarized. Mm -hmm. You know, you have um, what they refer to as the Tea Party movement, uh, led by the likes of um, Sarah Palin and Glenn Beck and these other right-wingers. And, um, uh, you know, they have actually fooled the American people into believing that... Um, they are the victims of big government. You know, I mean, I don't know, I feel sorry for the American people because they are so easily, you know, misled. <laughs> they are so easily duped when in fact they know that there are very deep structural problems in the, within the American system. I mean, we have talked about it on earlier programs because of, you know, America's massive debt, um, 14 trillion dollars external debt, which is equal to the total GDP of the United States. plus. Uh, 38 billion dollars, uh, uh, sorry, trillion dollars, I'm not, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes. So 14 trillion dollars external debt, 38 trillion dollars uh, internal debt. That's 52 trillion dollars of debt. And the U.S. keeps on accumulating 443 billion dollars a year on interest on top of this debt. So it's a sort of never-ending cycle of misery. Mm -hmm. And these are structural problems and you have 
both in the conservative, I mean, the, the Republican as well as the Democratic Party, the top people are basically the, the people who are heads of multinational corporations. And all policies are formulated in order to help them or to, you know, benefit them. And so here you have in the U.S. these, these right-wingers coming up. Uh, Sarah Palin even sort of, you know, on, on her website, she has put, like, you know, these, these uh, target marks on a number of places, including Gabriel Gifford's constituency in the United States, or the saying that this we need to target. I mean, she said, uh, I mean, one of her slogans was, don't retreat, reload. In other words, like she was saying that, you know, you should keep on fighting. And, you know, she went, went, you know, later on she said, well, that's not what I meant. What I meant was that we should, you know, recharge our batteries, etc. But, I mean, an average person would, when you say reload, that automatically triggers in your mind a gun, right. not not sort of you know reload for uh, for a, a clean fight, you know. And in America, for instance, there are millions and millions of guns in the hands of people, and that's what they call their right. That everybody has the right to bear arms. Right. I mean, Subhanallah, you you you, you know you you have millions of guns in people's hands. All it takes is just one nut to kill somebody. And that's what has happened. Exactly what we just saw. Exactly what we saw. I mean, you know, what was this, this, you know, poor congresswoman doing? She was there meeting her people, her constituents. I mean, this was called Congress at your corner. That was the, the theme of her sort of meeting people in Tucson, Arizona. And Arizona, of course, is a, is a particularly sort of, you know, um, critical state in the sense that there has been a lot of tension over there as well over these illegal immigrants coming from Mexico. Like, you know, there are certain states like Arizona, New Mexico, California, etc., Texas, that border, uh, the, the, that border Mexico, and there are a lot of illegal immigrants that come because Mexicans are poor people. And so they come, they want to find jobs. And then um, a law was passed in which uh, they, uh, it, it was said that um, uh, we, we should increase border patrols and give more rights to the, 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 you know, the border patrol officers. And there have been a lot of shootings over there, a lot of, you know, Mexicans have been killed and um, uh, Gabriel Giffords was opposed to that she said that that's wrong I think we need to deal with this in a better way right. and there were other sensible voices as well over there so the fact that there were these right wingers who were actually playing on people's sentiments uh, you know the Latinos Mexicans even Muslims for instance in the US Congress they they presented a bill talking about radicalization of uh, Muslims in America and how they pose a threat to the U.S. So all of these things, they're basically fear-mongering, creating paranoia. And in that atmosphere, no matter what Sarah, uh, Sarah Palin or Glenn Beck or, or Rush Limbaugh or these other right-wingers say, the words that they say are going to have an impact on some nutcase. I mean, it, as I said, it doesn't take too many nutcases to, to create chaos. Right. And that's unfortunately what has happened over there. Well, both uh, U.S. President Barack Obama and Sarah Palin recently made speeches, uh, the topic of which was this tragedy that occurred. How, how can you compare their speeches? Oh, uh, I think they, they were very, very, uh, uh, you know, illustrative. Um, Obama came across as a very sort of, you know, sober, very fatherly figure trying to provide the healing touch. And Sarah Palin you know, came across as very aggressive. I mean, she even used the word blood libel. I think it was terrible. Wow. I mean, you know, she, she actually was taken to task by a lot of people. But all she was doing was she was trying to defend herself. I mean, she was trying to defend the indefensible. Mm -hmm. I think it showed that she's not a very smart person, that she's really playing to people's emotions, but there is only a, a you know, small constituency for that. Whereas Obama definitely came across as a much more sensible person. On January 12th, the Lebanese government, led by Prime Minister Saad Hariri, fell because 11 ministers, 10 of whom were from Hezbollah, resigned. Could you give us a brief background on why exactly these Hezbollah members are resigning from the government and what impact it's having? Yes, you see, in, in Lebanon, um, there has been a sort of um, very tenuous uh, political um, sort of, you know, stability. Um, it was uncertain because Saad Hariri on his own could not form a government, what is, ref what is referred to as the um, March 14th movement, like there is a coalition of uh, groups. Hezbollah, of course, is the strongest group in Lebanon, but uh, uh, they have not really pushed their luck too much or they have not been pushing for their rights because they want to stabilize the situation and not create more problems. But the bottom line of this current crisis is 
in what is referred to as the Special Tribunal for Lebanon that was established by the United Nations, uh, which is investigating the assassination of Rafiq Hariri, uh, who is the father of Saad Hariri, who, who used to be the former Prime Minister. This happened on February the 14th, 2005. Um, and initially, Syria was accused of being involved in Rafiq Hariri's assassination. So Syria was pressured to withdrawing its forces from Lebanon that were basically performing a peacekeeping role. Then once Syrian forces were withdrawn, then the accusations or accusing fingers turned towards Hezbollah. And now there were indications that um, the UN tribunal is going to name some members of Hezbollah. And Hezbollah has demanded of the government that it should call a, an emergency cabinet meeting to address this issue. But Saad Hariri refused. Right. And so they said, okay, if you refuse, then what we are going to do is we are going to withdraw from the government, we are going to resign. And according to the um, agreement that was drawn up when this coalition government was established, if 11 cabinet ministers resigned from this 30 member cabinet, then the government would automatically stand dissolved. So that's what has happened. And Hezbollah is saying that the Lebanese government should take responsibility. They have now demanded of um, the, the, the president um, saying that he should not give the interim government to Saad Hariri again. In fact, some neutral person should be uh, appointed so that this whole mess that Lebanon is in that can be taken care of. I mean, obviously, there is American interference, there is Israeli interference, there is Saudi interference. The, the Syrians are deeply involved. Iran is involved because they have their own interests in Lebanon. And each party is trying to support the groups that it uh, feels uh, can advance their policies. On January 14th, the Tunisian strongman President Zain al Abidin bin Ali fled the country after weeks of protest. Why the protests and were you expecting him to be overthrown so quickly? Well, first of all, let's deal with his overthrow. I was actually quite surprised because um, uh, Zain al Abidin bin Ali, who took over in a coup, it was a peaceful coup from Habib Bourguba, the, the former president, in 1987. Uh, he's ruled the country for 23 years and uh, Ben Ali was a military general, he was intelligence chief and he had been the previous government etc. So I thought he would have a pretty strong hold on the country but apparently not. And these demonstrations actually uh, started on December 17th when a university graduate who couldn't find a job, who was actually, um, his name was Muhammad Abu Azizi, uh, who was actually um, uh, had become a street vendor. He had just a cart and he used to sell vegetables, although he was a university graduate. This reflects the kind of sort of, you know, problem in the Tunisian society right. that millions of people were unemployed. There was a lot of corruption in society. Uh, ben Ali's own family was involved in corruption, his son-in-law, his family members, etc. And so on December 17th, the police actually confiscated Abu Azizi's um, cart that you know you don't have a, a permit for this so they're confiscated and obviously his his livelihood I mean here is a university graduate he cannot feed himself he cannot feed his family he was so frustrated by this that he committed suicide oh my goodness and this of course uh, suicide is haram in Islam right when he committed suicide it shook the Tunisian society so much that people stood up immediately they said enough is enough here is a government that's so corrupt that's so oppressive in fact um, journalists without borders have said that Press freedom is so tightly controlled uh, in Tunisia, like, you know, among the 178 countries, uh, Tunisia ranks 164th in uh, press censorship. That means it's so oppressive, like, mm -hmm. you know, nothing, people can't say anything. So the street protest started and, of course, the police in typical fashion started to brutalize the people, started killing them. And that um, naturally, um, you know, enraged people more. There are, you know, scores of people killed. And... Um, Although Ben Ali tried to make some concessions, but people had had enough. So the final sort of, you know, thing came on Thursday, uh, I mean, on, on January the 13th, Thursday, January the 13th, when he announced certain concessions. But the next day, he tried to impose a curfew and dismiss the government and said, we are going to impose a state of emergency. But the people had had enough. And so I think within the ruling circles, they decided that uh, in order to stabilize the situation, Ben Ali has to go. But I think Tunisia really uh, will only see peace if there is a genuine democracy and they follow the rule of law. Otherwise, I'm afraid this chaos will continue. 
Well, we see this as sort of a theme in the region, but what sort of implications do you see this having on the broader Middle East region? Oh, of course. I think every one of those rulers in the Middle East must be terribly worried at the present time. <laughs> I mean, you have Mubarak, you have King Abdullah of Jordan, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. All of these people, I'm sure, are very worried because um, Tunisia um, is sort of, you know, a microcosm of what is happening in the Middle East. So all of them must be very worried men right now. A conference is being held at the Islamic Society of York Region in which Cynthia McKinney, a former U.S. Congresswoman and Democratic presidential candidate um, from 2004, will be speaking. What exactly is the theme of this conference? Well, the overall theme of the conference is um, global peace in the age of imperialism. And um, yes, as you said, um, we have invited Cynthia McKinney. We are very excited about it. Uh, that she accepted our invitation. She's a very courageous woman. She's a very um, uh, brilliant speaker. Uh, she was a congresswoman in the United States House of Representatives for many years. And um, uh, that um, we wanted her actually to uh, participate in the conference because, um, you know, we feel that uh, a lot is happening in the world and she is probably a very suitable person who can address this issue in terms of U.S. policies, in terms of its impact on other parts of the world, particularly the Muslim world, uh, because the U.S. is deeply involved there. So we thought somebody like her, who is articulate, who is courageous, who, is, who stands for justice and peace, and we thought uh, a team like that would be very suitable for her to address. So we, we are very excited about her participation and um, also very grateful that uh, she agreed to our invitation. Initially, she was reluctant uh, because she's, I know she's very busy because she's writing a book as well at the present time. But uh, I spoke to her uh, a few times and finally was able to convince her uh, that she should participate in this program and she fortunately accepted the invitation. So we look forward to having her at our conference, which will be incidentally held on Saturday, February the 12th uh, at the Islamic Society of York Region at 1380 Stovall Road. And so we look forward to having her with us on that date. So we're sure our viewers are as excited as we are about seeing her here. Where exactly can they get tickets? Of course, from the Islamic Society of York Region, and they can contact us at 905-887-8913 or also on our email address, uh, which is crescent at ca.inter.net. But I'd like to warn everybody that they should get their tickets ahead of time because just like the Galloway program, mm -hmm. we ran out of tickets and then many people were disappointed. So hope that they will not be disappointed this time. Thank you very much, Brother Zafar. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us on another episode of Muslim Perspectives. We hope you'll join us next week. For Muslim Perspectives, I'm Afifa Kawaja. Assalamu alaikum.